Kia ora everyone, welcome to this Goodfellow Unit webinar. Tonight we're speaking on caring for our older patients and the impact of frailty on prescribing medication and why this is important. Now tonight's uh, presentation is kindly supported by Pharmac and I'd like to introduce our expert speaker who's Dr Chris Cameron. Chris is a general physician and clinical pharmacologist working in Wellington and she has a focus on rational prescribing for the elderly. Welcome Chris. Thanks Helen, it's lovely to be here. Hi everybody. Today I'm going to talk about um, several issues and I, I'm going to just talk briefly about polypharmacy which if you're anything like me that word makes you just want to go to sleep. Um, and then I'm going to talk about um, frailty um, and how their impacts on how we prescribe and uh, de-prescribe for our patients. Um, and then I'm going to introduce the concept of PIMS, not the drink, but uh, the concept around prescribing. And I'm going to cover three cases uh, to uh, illustrate these concepts. So just first a slide on polypharmacy, because um, I think this illustrates a um, uh, something about polypharmacy that I think is sort of a key thing, really. So there are all these million tools to um, that tell you how to stop medication um, in uh, various people and drugs that are inappropriate for old people. And some of the um, some of these tools are actually uh, pages and pages long. And I, I don't know who would be able to use these tools because no one in clinical practice would really have the time to do them. Um, but these number of tools have been proven um, to, not surprisingly, to decrease the number of drugs that the patient uh, is being prescribed. Um, but uh, as I've noted here, none of them have ever actually shown any impact on um, quality of life or mortality. So the actual um, evidence for improved clinical outcomes from just taking a random patient and cutting down the number of drugs that they're taking, um, which actually is can be quite hard work. There's no evidence for any improved clinical outcomes at all. So don't feel bad that you don't do it because I don't either. But um, there are things that we can do to rationalize patients' drugs. And this is my approach only. Um, and I don't know if anyone who uses the same approach and it has grown organically over years of clinical practice. And so I'm sharing it with you because I think it might be a useful thing that you perhaps could do in your practice. Okay, and so the reason I think that um, just looking at polypharmacy, even though it's a hot and trendy topic, uh, is not the thing to do, is because I think it's coming from the wrong angle. I think these these tools were developed most uh, a lot of them by pharmacists, so they are obviously looking at drugs. But actually, I think the easiest way to start is with the patient, not with these drugs are no good. It's what is right for this patient in front of me. So this is the first case. Um, and this is sort of a kind of a typical case that I would see working in general medicine uh, and you guys would see in your practice. So this is an elderly lady living in a rest home uh, who had what is called a mechanical fall, which I think is a, a, not a useful term at all, in 2012 and um, broke her hip and now uses a walker to mobilise and maximum uh, exercise tolerance is about um, 500 metres. She had an MI some, <coughs> pardon me, 13 years ago, but left ventricular function is normal. She doesn't get any angina. She now has mild cognitive impairment and has had hypertension for 50 odd or 60 maybe years since she was pregnant and maybe had a TIA a few years ago. She had an episode of something which lasted less than an hour and nobody quite knew what it was. Um, and so um, a lot of our neurologists have quite a low threshold for labeling things TIA, and so it may have been TIA, may not have been TIA. And these are her medications, so Fosamax Plus, which she's been on uh, since she broke the hip, Metoprolol, Salazoprol, uh, Atorvastatin, and um, just because it seemed like a good idea, at some stage somebody started her on some omeprazole. And just some key um, observations here is that her heart rate is 67. She's in sinus rhythm, uh, heart, the pulse is regular. Blood pressure 188 lying, 110 standing, and she was unable to get out of a chair without using her arms, which is kind of a basic screen for um, proximal muscle strength, proximal leg strength, sorry. 
So this is my approach to diagnosing frailty. Um, and one of our geriatricians, uh, when I asked her, um, you know, how do you, what's a quick and easy way on the post-acute ward round for me to say somebody's frail or not frail, um, when by the time we have patients in hospital, it, they're ill, that's why they're in hospital, and it doesn't always reflect what they're like in the community, and it's not much point in me saying a patient is frail in hospital when they're at home, they're scooting around in their sports car. Um, and so she alerted me to this thing called the Clinical Frailty Scale, um, and this is was published, um, or this was actually, uh, the study was undertaken in Canada and they validated it there for mortality and um, even a junior doctor could get this right apparently because all you've really got to do is figure out how the patient ambulates when they're not in hospital. So it really is very simple. Um, so the, the first three groups are not frail, obviously these people are managing well at home. Uh, then you start getting into the sort of the pre-frail or early frailty, I suppose you could call it. Um, and then you have people who are very frail uh, and then there's the terminally ill. Um, and then underneath that, you'll find the little thing about dementia, which pretty much says that anyone who has dementia is frail or they should be considered as frail, even if physically, uh, as many dementia patients are, they're quite active. So you don't need one of those crazy looking hand grip things. You don't need to get the patient up out of bed or in, in the GP practice walking 30 meters and back. Um, all you really need to do is decide how they ambulate outside hospital and that will tell you whether they're frail or not. Obviously this is not a perfect tool. It's designed to be quick and dirty, but it is validated. And the usefulness of doing that is it starts to change it's a frame shift. I find that I start thinking about these people as a, almost like a different species to someone who's not frail. So I, I do not use age. Um, I don't like to say that um, you know everyone over 80 has to be lumped together and we need to chop their medications. I think whether they're frail, no matter what, how old they are, or not frail is is now the chain, the definition change I use. Um, so that the clinical frailty score predicts mortality. If the patient is hospitalized and they're frail, um, they don't do well. They uh, have a 50% chance of not getting back to where they were before they came into hospital um, and a 10% chance of mortality in three months. So on talking to other people um, and how they diagnose frailty, um, I think it was Bruce Errol who suggested that any elderly person in rest home level care or hospital level care, when I asked them about this at a pharmac meeting, are frail. And I thought, yeah, that's another good one because that's easy as well. And of course that won't be 100% true, but it's probably pretty good. And one of our other geriatricians said, a great question is, um, who helps you with your shopping? And if the person says, well, no one helps me with my shopping, I do it all myself, then they're clearly not frail. But if, the, if they say that they need help to do their shopping, then they're frail. Again, these are easy tools, uh, not requiring specialised equipment or a lot of time. So our patient, Joan, um, she is frail. She's lived in rest home level care since she broke her hip and she walks with a walker. So we know that if Joan gets admitted to hospital, uh, then she'll have a 10% chance of mortality within three months and she may not reach her baseline. Uh, and there's wide variation of mortality predictions and frailty, and I'd really would love to have a figure that I could say that, maybe not to patients, but you know, to uh, other doctors, that there's a, um, a chance of more, X percent chance of mortality, but it seems to average out at about 50% at three years. So once the diagnosis of frailty is made, then life expectancy is shorter uh, considerably um, than for a patient who's not frail which is important when it comes to medications. So once you've decided that the patient is frail, and then I start to think, well, especially if I see a long list of medications, maybe some of these could be trimmed because maybe the chances of medications harming a frail patient are much higher than they are of harming a not frail patient. So if a patient's 85 and they're not frail, then I I'd usually park that discussion about uh, de-prescribing, but if they are frail, no matter what age they are, and I can see a lot of medication um, that is potentially causing the patient harm, then I think that's a good time to have that conversation. So once you're frail, um, one of the 
uh, definitions of frailty physiologically is you have decreased physiological reserve. So uh, little things make the patients fall or have geriatric syndromes, become sedated, all sorts of adverse things occur with drugs. So harm from drugs in the frail uh, is, uh, is much higher than it is in the non-frail. So that's number three there. Um, and patients don't come to us and say, um, I'm, I'm frail and I think I've got an adverse drug event to my drug. Um, they come to us and, and they've fallen over and they've broken something. Um, they're not right for whatever reason, they're confused. Um, and, and those are the sort of people who get these things from drugs. Uh, so number one there, benefits. So is my patient benefiting from that drug? Not does the population benefit from that drug, because the answer may be yes, but is my patient who I've now said is frail, is he or she benefiting from the drug that is being prescribed? Number two, so harm from withdrawing the drugs. That is something that we place a you know, really great importance on. Obviously, we don't want to stop the drugs and the patient has a stroke or a heart attack or whatever, um, because that would make us feel very bad <coughs> and the family might be annoyed. Uh, so uh, that is obviously a very important thing to us to know that we're not going to do harm or the chances of us doing harm by withdrawing the drugs is not that high, we hope. And the benefits from withdrawing a drug. So, um, maybe Joan will improve. Um, maybe she'll fall less or uh, be able to get out of her chair um, if we withdraw some of her drugs. So these things are a little bit harder to quantify, obviously. Okay, so interestingly, when I looked for mortality data in the old and frail, or very elderly and frail, um, I, it was really quite hard to find this information. And I came across this quite old study, which was done in uh, Gisborne uh, in 1985. And this is Joan in her younger years, enjoying the surf in Gisborne. Um, but now she's in a rest home, unfortunately. And so she probably doesn't get out on the surf too often. Uh, but this, this really interesting study looked at a group of uh, quite old elderly, which um, was really good. And they looked at them at baseline and then again in four to five years, depending on you know how long the person had lived from that time. And what they found was that the things that caused or associated with mortality were frailty, which is, I've just said, we know that frail, people, frail elderly do die earlier than the not frail. Dementia, um, who are also frail. Urinary incontinence, which is, I think, due to the white matter lesions in the brain causing the urinary incontinence, which might also cause dementia. Drugs, so that's number of drugs, more drugs, uh, increased mortality. The ESR, which I guess is the marker of inflammation and falls, uh, which is not overly surprising. So the thing that I felt that was interesting that was missing there was um, hypertension, cardiovascular disease. So those things when you get to this age seem to be less associated with mortality. And these other things, uh, you know, take more precedence over the traditional things that kill you earlier in life. <coughs> so what stops us stopping drugs when the patient becomes frail? Um, you know, there are lots of things and I don't really want to go into them and you guys will be as familiar with these things as I am. Um, one of the things is that patients when they started on these medications, which could be 20 years ago, um, are told that they're going to be lifelong. So uh, I used to do that as well. And, and I've changed my lifelong to long term um, because that sort of doesn't, long term could mean anything. It could mean one year, it could mean five years. Uh, what I take that to mean myself is until it's no longer appropriate. But if the patient has been told the drug is lifelong, it is kind of difficult to stop them. The longer conversation. Um, but so what we need to know is and the two key questions, I think, uh, is my patient benefit, benefiting? Is Joan benefiting? Um, and will Joan come to harm if I stop some of her drugs? Because if I'm really concerned that Joan will come to harm, I'm most unlikely to stop her drugs. So I've just said that I don't use any of those stop starting tools and I um, de-prescribe things so, 
mainly based on um, frailty. And a good time, I find, to have these discussions with patients, um, or this is probably easier when you work in a hospital, because a patient comes to hospital with something wrong with them. And I, it will be the same for most of you guys as well. The patient will come to the surgery complaining of something. Um, they don't <coughs> usually come, well, they don't come to hospital when they're unwell. Um, so it is kind of easier to have that conversation in some ways, because something has gone wrong. So the patient has had a fall, um, or they've been told that they're frail, or you know that they're frail, or they've had any of these issues which are related or could be related to uh, an inappropriate medication. So PIMS um, with one M is a potentially inappropriate medicine. Um, and uh, there's not so much a list of drugs that are PIMS, it's really what in that patient is inappropriate. Um, the other time when it's good to have that discussion is when the patient when there's a clear decrease in their life expectancy, they've been diagnosed with a, a life-limiting illness, which you know can be many, many different things. So if the patient is on PIMS, it does all these things, but I guess probably the most important thing is it causes they cause disability and they increase mortality. So moving along now to falls. So falls are um, sort of we're not quite the bread and butter of general medicine, but you know we would see probably um, five patients with falls a day, and these are only the ones who are not having them operated on. Uh, and one thing I found quite useful to know, like quite often I'd try to work out why the patient had a fall. And then I read this paper and they just talked about frailty in that in the elderly, 65% um, of falls are simply due to frailty and all that frailty encompasses. So a lack of balance, uh, an inability to right oneself. Um, all, so only a few falls, or well, only about a third of falls in the over 70 year old are actually due to something you can hang your hat on. So a vasovagal syncope or an orthostatic hypotension or some sort of neurological disease. A single event means something like a, an arrhythmia um, so the largest percentage of falls in the elderly are simply due to frailty. Um, and the number of falls every year is, is huge. So half of rest home residents fall every year uh, and, and quite a high number of those cause uh, fractures and other injuries, facial injuries uh, particularly uh, prevalent or concerning, I guess. So what increases the risk of falls in the frail. So uh, I've already said that frail people fall um, and uh, the reasons for that are um, manifold, but um, usually it starts in the brain. So the patient might have a lot of white matter lesions in the brain in areas uh, that control balance, so they have poor balance. Um, and then if you add in one of these drugs or anything that acts in the brain at all, then uh, the patient has an inability to right themselves. So the poor balance is bad, but it might be that they can um, catch themselves on a piece of furniture uh, if they go to fall. But if they're on these medications or any other medication that acts in the brain, does anything in the brain, then they're less likely to be able to prevent that fall. Once they go, they're gone. And that's why minimizing things that act in the brain uh, and trimming the stuff that's not essential uh, is really important in, in the frail elderly who fall. Um, so when thinking of falls, think anything acting in the brain, number one, and then there's you know quite a, a lot of daylight. Uh, and the next class of drugs that cause falls are anything that causes orthostatic hypotension. And of course, some of those things are really difficult to avoid because the patient might have uh, angina or heart failure and require some of these medications. Um, but probably the worst culprits in this lot are the, anything that reduces preload. So diuretics, deplete volume, reduce preload, cause orthostatic hypotension. The patient stands up, has a momentary dizzy turn. Uh, usually these things only last about 30 seconds to a minute and patient will be fine, but sometimes they're not fine and they fall. Um, and then you've got your other cardiovascular drugs. These ones will cause the problem, but 
the most common cause uh, of orthostatic hypotension, that group, is the diuretics and nitrates. The other thing that should go on that list is the phosphodiesterase inhibitors like um, Viagra. I can't think of Viagra's other name at the moment, but, but that class of drugs. <clears throat> and then drugs that slow the heart. And then the third uh, most common cause of falls in the frail is um, the drugs that affect muscle weakness. Um, so when we stand up, um, initially we have the baroreceptors which do their job, but the second thing that happens is the muscle pump in the legs. So the muscles contract and they return blood to the heart. And if you have muscle weakness or muscle and or muscle wasting, um, then you've, you've lost one of your means of getting blood back to the heart and increasing your blood pressure on standing. Uh, and of course, many elderly and frail people are on something from this group, a couple of things from that group, and obviously statins are pretty common. Uh, and just generalized sarcopenia of the old um, will cause muscle weakness as well, just because you've got less volume of muscle. So those are the main drugs that we look at trimming for the frail. So back to Joan, can we rationalize her drugs? Um, and uh, are the drugs benefiting her? So these are the questions that we could be, I've said that Joan is frail. So it's a time to sit down with Joan and go through some of these medications and say, you know, some of these may not be benefiting you anymore uh, and could we stop them? Okay, so should I pop back to Joan's medications quickly just so we can refresh our memories because I can do the same for myself. Yes, good idea. <laughs> there we go. So Joan, she's only on five drugs, so it's not it's not the end of the world. So Fosamax Plus, uh, Metoprolol, Salazapril, Statin, and Somomeprazole. And there's her problem list again. Okay, so she's got hypertension, which has obviously been a problem, but normal LV systolic function. She's got a postural drop, <laughs> and she's got probably proximal muscle weakness. So let's go back down to Joan here. So bisphosphonates, Joan has had a fracture. Um, so she falls into this category as a woman with a previous fracture um, and probably low bone mineral density. So bisphosphonates do benefit. Um, they do help prevent a second fracture, but the number needed to treat for hip fractures is 100. So we have to treat 100 women with a bisphosphonate for five years to prevent one hip fracture. So, you know, Joan might be that woman in the 100, um, but there's a 99% chance she's not going to be that woman. So the other question that arises more commonly these days are things like bisphosphonate holidays, which sounds lovely, doesn't it? it sounds like something quite nice, but... Um, the, the evidence for bisphosphonate holiday, I tried to look this up over the weekend, there really isn't good evidence for a holiday. Um, a holiday implies that you return home at the end of it. Um, so this trial here, the Horizon PFT, which was the continuation of this, the Horizon trial, they got these three groups. One group had zolendronate for three years, one had it for six years, and one had it, and one group had it for the whole nine years. And actually what they found was that there was no difference between the three and the six year group. And the, in the nine year group, they did a lot of fudging, but it, it seemed to be that the hip, there were more hip fractures in the nine year group. Well, there, there were more fractures and they didn't say how many of them were hips. <coughs> but I think what we could conclude from that is that three years of zolendronate was enough. Uh, there was certainly no evidence for any longer treatment. Um, and bearing in mind that I don't think there's good evidence for having a holiday and coming back to it, um, and I don't think that trial has been done, or if it has, I couldn't locate one, uh, probably three years is enough. We now know that bisphosphonates have adverse effects that perhaps were not apparent when pa patients were put on them long term 10 or 20 years ago. So could Joan stop her bisphosphonate? Yeah, she could. She's been on it six years now. Um, and her chance of having another hip fracture is not high. So on moving along to Joan's hypertension. So um, we know that in middle age, um, that hypertension is a really important risk factor and treating hypertension uh, throughout the lifespan, um, or, well, younger and middle age is really, really important. 
Um, and so this doesn't apply to Joan because she's got well-established hypertension. But one thing I would say is that uh, hypertension, even though it seems like such a th simple thing to diagnose, uh, it often by the time we see the patient either in the GP practice or me in my clinic or in hospital, um, by the time I actually take the blood pressure, the patients often, especially in clinic, they've struggled to find a park, uh, they've rushed along and they're all flustered and their blood pressure uh, is much higher than it would be had we managed to rest them. So we know that 10 minutes rest, just sitting in a chair, it doesn't have to be lying up in, um, they'll get about 75% drop in blood pressure back towards what their actual blood resting blood pressure is. So when I'm talking about blood pressure, sorry, I'm talking about resting blood pressure, obviously. A lot of the time, patient, the blood pressure that we're monitoring is not truly resting. A surprising number of patients have white coat hypertension. Um, and, and the effect of that is actually quite high. Uh, so the difference between 120 and 140 systolic blood pressure is quite a lot. Um, so the best way to decide if you're in doubt and you're not certain whether the patient actually has hypertension, it will be the difference between treating and not. If, if your local hospital can do an ambulatory blood pressure, um, it, in our hospital, it's the most underused test. I think I'm one of the only people who ever requests it. Uh, that will take the blood pressure intermittently during the night and will tell you whether the patient truly has hypertension. Um, but really 10 minutes resting in the chair will do it for most people. But blood pressure, like I've just said, for the middle-aged people, blood pressure treatment, really important. For the frail elderly, it seems that sort of there's a flip in that uh, they, the frail elderly seem to do better, and the oldest old, uh, with a higher blood pressure, a higher systolic blood pressure. And there are multiple clinical trials that show this, uh, and I was quite surprised by the evidence here, which seemed to be really quite strong. Um, so a higher blood pressure uh, associated with increased physical resilience uh, and reduced cognitive decline. Uh, and the lower blood pressure, those, the older frail people, they just did, they did worse with the low blood pressure. So treating blood pressure in the frail elderly um, is probably not as useful as we might think. So in a study, this study over here, the 80, I'm going to show in a minute, uh, these patients were all 85. Uh, and in this one here. And so this line up the top here, these were the patients with a systolic blood pressure of greater than 200, which makes me gulp even to think about it. Uh, but these people had the best survival at five years. So their survival was 1.5 times uh, the group who was sort of in the middle here. Uh, so it takes a brave doctor to let a patient run a resting blood pressure of over 200. Um, but Reading through those trials, I was quite convinced of that uh, evidence. So their outcomes were directly related to systolic blood pressure. The lower the systolic blood pressure, this line down the bottom here, the, one, the less than 120, they really did not do well. Uh, so it was just so directly related to systolic blood pressure, five year survival. Chris, so that I, was really interesting. I have Sorry. had one question come in just saying how significant is arterial sclerosis in elderly hypertension? Oh, definitely. So isolated systolic hypertension is almost universal. Once we get to about 60, that's this hardening of the arteries. That should be considered just hypertension, really. They're possibly the pathology is slightly different in that all of us get, well, almost all of us get that, but not all of us die of hypertension-related causes. So clearly for some people that hypertension isn't actually physiologically important. Um, and I don't know that the difference is truly known yet but it's and it's difficult to know whether it's just isolated systolic hypertension or true hypertension so i can't i can't be 100 percent certain on that but i would just go with treating or not treating based on that top number great thank you so moderate to severe hypertension so um this cochrane review cochrane did a whole bunch of reviews on hypertension in the elderly about nearly 10 years ago now but and they haven't been updated um, I looked for, to see the update just recently. Um, <clears throat> but what they found was that in the under 80s, um, treating hypertension prevented cardiovascular death. Um, in the over 80s, it didn't. Uh, so this might be one, one time where you can just put a sort of a blanket age cutoff. 
Um, but in the under 80s, you still needed to treat a surprising number of people to prevent one of these adverse outcomes. Um, but the number needed to harm from treating the hypertension was actually quite low, although the harm was things like uh, lightheadedness on standing up, which possibly is not really a harm unless you fall over and break something. Um, and, and these were five year follow ups. So, yeah, tr oh, in the over 80s, again, treating moderate to severe hypertension, no evidence. No evidence that it prevents any of these things or, uh, or death. So that's antihypertensives in the frail elderly, which is an, you know, an enormous um, uh, pill burden for a lot of these people. Um, so I then wondered, I looked at all this a couple of years ago, um, uh, and I, I wondered what the evidence was for actually continuing or stopping some of these cardiovascular drugs in patients who'd had uh, acute coronary syndrome. Um, because it seemed to me that a lot of them were just continued on forever and really never stopped. Uh, and even sometimes if the patient was having adverse effects from them. So what I discovered was that after acute coronary syndrome or MI, uh, the risk of dying is, is high for uh, a while. Um, so at, at six months, about a fifth of those patients have had another major cardiovascular event. Uh, it could be a stroke or a TIA or angina or another MI. Um, after six months, it sort of starts, things start to change. Um, and I wasn't really sure why that was, but I will come back to that in a minute or two. Um, so it sort of seems like after six months, things settle down. Um, and in, but in patient, and these are patient, patients with acute uh, or subacute, I guess, cardiovascular disease. But in stable cardiovascular disease, these are kind of different patients again. Uh, and, and they don't tend to die so much, unless they got heart failure when you can't really stop the drugs and they do tend to die. Uh, so the, the acute and subacute group are one group, and then there's the stable group are another group. Um, so I was asking myself, well, how if the patient is stable, and that would be like Joan, my example patient, um, things happened 10 or more years ago and not much has happened since. Nothing has happened since. Is there any benefit for Joan continuing her medication? She's now frail. Uh, do I have to continue the statin and the zolazapro? And... I can't really say. Oh, God, that's Siri. <laughs> Siri's trying to answer my question. <laughs> I, I wonder if she can. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, she just said she couldn't. Uh, so, and of course, like you guys, I was worried about harming the patient if I stopped some of the drugs. And I was worried also about upsetting the cardiologist. Um, and then I gave my talk to the cardiologists and they were really supportive of stopping drugs in the elderly. So I no longer worry about that. So what I found was that if the patient had had a recent uh, acute coronary event or cardiovascular event, um, and we either started a statin and then stopped it or stopped the statin that they've been on for a long time, the patients did really poorly. So the time to rationalize these things is not in the first six months. After six months, the plaque stabilizes. So, um, you know, the, the uh, cholesterol cap regrows over the top of the plaque and it's no longer ruptured and unstable. Uh, so they're, they're different cohorts. So these people have got unstable plaque. These ones have got stable plaque. So, and the magic time is most, people who are not diabetics, uh, the plaque is mostly healed in 95% of people at six months. So if the patient, unfortunately for diabetics, sometimes plaques don't stabilize. You know, it takes a year uh, or sometimes two years and there really isn't a good way of knowing whether the plaque is stable or not. Um, and so unfortunately for diabetics, their risk period is much longer than six months or maybe much longer than six months. For patients who are not diabetics, uh, six months is a, sort of the golden time where you can start to look at stopping some of these medications. Uh, so these benefits are there in the frail elderly, uh, if they've had an MI or acute coronary syndrome for up to six months. After that, of course, they, as long as they're not diabetic, the, the benefits of having these drugs diminishes.
Um, and so what is this magic plaque stabilization? It is not a magical process and it really seems to be related to uh, a reduction in the LDL. And I think that's why cardiologists are wanting to push that LDL lower, lower, lower. Um, because we know that if we give a, a potent statin, you stabilize the part better and quicker. But of course, none of these trials were done in the frail elderly. <coughs> we just don't know whether they're any better off with a high dose statin or a low dose statin, but there's certainly nothing to say that they need a high dose statin for six months. Um, because we know for statins, this wonderful curve here, well, graph, uh, that they have a really flat dose response. So if we look here at A12 the statin, which is the one that most of us will use these days, uh, so if we give the patient 10 milligrams of atorvastatin, which is a low dose and you're less likely to get side effects at that low dose, then they'll get 73% uh, of the maximum uh, LDL lowering that that drug can give. And if we double the dose, we only get another 11%. And if we double it again, we get another 10%. And then we get the maximum 80 milligram. Um, but I think probably if we're looking at a harm versus benefit, then the benefits of 10 milligrams, which give you 73% lowering and much, obviously, a hugely lower incidence of side effects, which in statins are mostly dose related, than the 80 milligram. So um, I tend to knock people back a lot down to 10 milligrams if they still need to be on a statin at all. Remembering that most of the patients after six months uh, don't. Okay, so Satin for secondary prevention. So patients who have had events, um, you can see the numbers needed for treatment are high. Number needed to treat uh, for benefit is high. Um, so we know that treating patients after they've had an event uh, with a statin does help, but the number needed to treat are quite high. So if I'm looking at Joan uh, and I'm thinking, is the statin likely to increase her life expectancy? Well, she might be number 83, but the chances of that aren't very high. Uh, and as for strokes, not high at all. Uh, and these were patients treated for five years. One thing we do know about statins is that the number needed to harm is much lower. So number needed to harm for muscle pain is only 10. Uh, all of you and me have seen patients complaining of muscle pain on a statin. And um, I do stop them or decrease the dose for all of those people now. Uh, interestingly, the number needed to harm for diabetes, to develop diabetes, new diabetes, uh, is 50. So you know, when you're looking at these numbers and then these numbers, the chances of harming someone from a statin, particularly an older, frailer person, are probably greater than they are for benefit, uh, even in patients with um, you know, quite high risk factors. So looking for trials of course of stopping uh, statins in the frail elderly is like looking for a needle in a haystack because clearly no drug company wants to do these trials um, to say that statins are anything less than amazing. Um, there are a couple of trials though and um, this one was a bunch of cancer patients and there was 380 of them and they were only expected to live another year with their cancer and they're expected to die of their cancer so uh, half the patients stopped their statin and half continued. There was no difference in cardiovascular outcomes, no difference in time survived. But this group who stopped the statin felt that their quality of life was better. Um, so this was one trial that did suggest that it was safe to stop statins in the final year of life. And many of our frail elderly, you know, they will be in their final year of life. Um, oh, there's another one as well. Sorry, I'm just flipping ahead trying to find. There's another trial I put in here, but it hasn't come up. Uh, so the risk of diabetes, I thought, was really interesting. And this was it's only a relatively recent thing. Um, this trial here looked at, I think, about 5,000 patients um, who were on statins. And half of them, um, no, half, sorry, 5,000 patients. Half of them were on statin and half of them weren't. And they followed them for five years. And so the, the group who weren't on a statin, about 5.8% of those patients developed diabetes. And the group who were on a statin, uh, it's pretty much double the risk. So 11.2%, which is you know, pretty high. Uh, 
and it appeared to be dose related. Um, but only for these two statins, and that might be because the numbers using the other statins were lower. Um, <laughs> but simvastatin appeared to be have the highest risk uh, of developing diabetes. So these are quite high risks, I thought. Um, statin myopathy, uh, obviously in clinical trials, it's said to be rare. Um, the data sheet says it's rare. Everyone says it's rare, but if it's so rare, why do we see it not infrequently? Um, and particularly if you ask patients, uh, have they got muscle aches or do they have muscle weakness or get them to try and stand up out of the chair, which tests the proximal leg muscles, um, then it's much, much more common. It is dose related, as is the diabetes risk. So dropping the dose right down to 10 milligrams of atorvastatin, if still needed, um, hopefully will uh, ameliorate that risk. Uh, and this trial done in Tasmania, uh, 800 community dwelling uh, elderly patients, statins increase the risk of falls and decrease the leg strength. Okay, so <clears throat> moving along from statins, we're still on, oh no, we're not on Joan's medication anymore, she wasn't on aspirin, um, but obviously many, many frail elderly are on aspirin. Chris, can uh, I, and just before we yes. move on to the aspirin, there were a couple of questions that came in with regards to the hypertension, yes. just quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, one was, how has the SPRINT trial been reviewed in this context? And also, does throwing the diabetes into the hypertension mix make a difference to what your plan might be with, with the hypertension, just before we move on? So the second question, no. Uh, it doesn't make any difference. So the SPRINT trial is really interesting because there was a, a bit of a, a, a follow-up to the SPRINT trial was um, published in the New England Journal just the other day. So I'm a little bit negative on the SPRINT trial um, because uh, even though it does show some benefit, the numbers needed to treat are really high. I think that it's about 80. And the suggestion that lowering someone's blood pressure to 120 millimetres of mercury makes no sense to me. It, it just doesn't. It goes against all these other trials. And the other thing it showed is that uh, the number needed to harm for a reduction in your EGFR of uh, greater than 30 mils per minute, I think it was, or it might have been 30%, was actually higher than the number who benefited. So again, it's looking at number needed to harm, number needed to treat. So there was a benefit, um, but the number needed to treat was quite high. Um, and personally, I think you'd be nuts to tr put a frail elderly person on. Um, actually, those patients weren't frail. There were no frail elderly in the group, and there were no rest home residents. So they were well elderly. Um, and uh, I think all the other clinical trials suggesting that it's not a good idea to bring the blood pressure down to 120 would sway me more than that one does. Great. Thank but for middle-aged people, totally supportive. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. So. Uh, Aspirin, uh, a lot of people just remain on their aspirin for donkey's years because it's a low dose. Um, uh, and what this trial, which was really heavily publicised, showed was that um, this was a large number of patients um, from that enormous database that they have in primary care in the UK. And these were, this was real life patients, secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. And the patients who stopped their aspirin, that's, they'd been on it for a long time and they stopped it, um, they did have an increased risk uh, of non-fatal MI. But the risk was perishingly low. So it was publicised as almost double the risk, which is, you know, technically speaking, true. But the risk was so low uh, that the actual number needed to harm by stopping aspirin was 250. And it didn't make any um, risk. It didn't change their risk of dying because, you know, most of those patients probably died of something else. Um, and those, you know, that was a good follow-up and a good trial, and it did show that you needed to stop a lot of aspirin before one person had a non-fatal MI, uh, and nobody died from having their aspirin stopped. But, you know, we do worry about it. So, again, I tried to find a, a decent trial that could guide our practice in patients who have uh, TIAs or a minor stroke, and <laughs> it's a little bit similar to the MI group, is that the risk is really high up front. Um, so if you have a TIA, then your risk of going on to having a CVA at one week is 10%, which you know, pretty is a little bit frightening, I think. Um, and uh, so you know, starting aspirin in that setting is, is a good thing. Uh, 
Uh, but this meta-analysis looking at a lot of patients found that at six weeks time, uh, you were better off taking aspirin, but the numbers are low. Um, and so not that many people went on after the first week to have a stroke. Um, and uh, that was just an, an, a stroke, but a big stroke at six weeks. Again, numbers are really slow, uh, small, but they do favor aspirin. But of course, because the numbers are so small, the number needed to treat is 91. But you know, treating someone with aspirin for six weeks is, is not a biggie most, most of the time, uh, so it's worth doing. But after 12 weeks, that benefit is gone. Uh, so all the trials looking at the net benefit of aspirin in this setting after 12 weeks did not show a benefit at all. Um, so it may be in some people that there is no harm in continuing the aspirin, um, but in a significant number of people, there will be harm. Um, so ignore the L. McPherson and Theresa May uh, shootout, but uh, on the front page of the Daily Express a couple of years ago, um, they it was published. This study was published. And it got a lot of attention in the UK, as you can see, it's on the front page here. And what they looked at um, this cohort of patients uh, who had had um, a stroke or a MI or some sort of cardiovascular event, they were on a tiny dose of aspirin, and they followed them for five years. Or oh, sorry, they didn't follow them. They looked back on them uh, over five years, and what they found was that. The rate of um, major bleeding for patients who are in middle age was really low. Pretty, you know, so probably not much harm being done there. It does sort of jump up a little bit here. But when we're talking about our patients who are the oldest old, uh, and many, many of those patients will be frail, uh, this is an annual rate of a life-threatening or fatal bleed is 2.5%. That is higher than I would uh, be happy with. Uh, with if it was my mother or me. Uh, I think that's quite, it's really interesting how age graded this was. Uh, so patients do tend to remain on aspirin because people think they're harmless. And usually they don't have a gastro protection um, because it's, it's only aspirin and it's a low dose. Um, but you know, we probably should bear that figure in mind, I think. So beta blockers, so Joan is taking a beta blocker. Uh, she doesn't have heart failure. She had a normal LV systolic function and she didn't get any angina. So how long do we continue the beta blocker for? So we know at one year uh, after an MI, beta blockers are a good thing. Uh, possibly up to three years in patients who have a full thickness infarct. Um, but for patients who, and we see these much less frequently, than we used to see full thickness infarcts 10 years ago. Um, but really no one benefited beyond three years. So maximum beta blocker post MI is probably one year for most people, but for those who've had a really uh, big infarct, up to three years, and then after that, it, they should be stopped. And the reason that they should be stopped is that because they impair function. So this trial looked at, um, uh, continuing on with the beta blocker, um, and these were these were quite elderly patients. Again, a lot of rest home residents, and what they found was that the patient was frail. They did fine, and uh, not frail. They did fine, um, but if the patient was frail, they they the beta blocker uh, contributed to a functional decline. Which obviously, in a frail rest home resident, a functional decline can make a big difference in what they can and can't do. <laughs> and the number needed to harm was 30 there. Uh, so, yeah, beta blockers probably after MI, they need to really be stopped after a year, unless the patient has LV systolic dysfunction or angina, in which case they would be used for that, those conditions. <clears throat> so that was case one. So do you want to see if there's any questions, Helen? Yeah, there's a couple more just before we move off the cardiovascular side of things. Um, what about aspirin mm. and multi-infarct dementia or in age-related ischemic changes yep. within the brain? Is it worth continuing in that context? Now, I can categorically say no to that because I thought to myself yesterday, hmm, I bet someone asked me about that. <laughs> and so I, I looked it up and I found that there was no benefit. Okay. And this was a recent trial published in April, I think. Okay. Um, it did not show any benefit in either of those settings for aspirin. Okay. 
Okay, fantastic. And we, that, yes, yes, thank you for that. And mm. in the discussion um, on statins, were you including type 1 and type 2 diabetes? So you're talking about um, diabetes altogether. Are you, were you looking at both both of those? The patients who develop diabetes? Yeah. Uh, no, the, the patients, what, how you, what you do with statins in patients with oh, diabetes. Oh, sorry. Um, that is a really good question. And I cannot remember what that trial said. I would assume both. Mm -hmm. But I can't be 100% sure about that because they, you know, they are different because uh, the type 2 might have other vascular risk factors. Uh, I would say it's probably both though, but I, I don't know for sure, sorry. Okay. And, and lastly, um, any comments on statins causing memory impairment? Yeah, that is very controversial, isn't it? Um, I think the jury is still out on that. The last thing I read, which was admittedly a couple of months ago, I couldn't draw any conclusions. I wanted to add it to that slide, but I didn't think the evidence was strong enough. But, you know, patients will swear that they, it does cause memory impairment. And I think it's uh, theoretically feasible. Mm -hmm. um, not sure. Thank you. One, one th that has just come through, what about aspirin and recurrent TIAs? So in the setting of, of recurrent TIAs, are you considering stopping it or continuing in that setting? Yeah, every time you have a TIA, I guess you sort of go back to the beginning, don't you? You have that six-week period where there's a high risk. And I think if the person's having multiple TIAs, um, then stopping and starting the aspirin probably doesn't make sense. Yeah. So if they're having more than, you know, I don't know, three or four TIAs a year, which obviously quite a few people do, I probably wouldn't stop it between them uh, unless there was a good reason to. Fantastic. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Great. Thanks, Chris. I'll let you move on to the next case. Okay, so the next case um, I is really focusing on uh, anticoagulation, which I know is a hot topic, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. So this, I'm just going to summarise this case, which probably you've all read while I was answering those questions, to say that this is an elderly man who is frail, uh, who has dementia, who falls a lot, uh, and has atrial fibrillation and chronic kidney disease. He's on aspirin because he had an MI donkeys years ago, uh, and he's on dibigatran for his atrial fibrillation, uh, a statin and a bunch of other things. So there's my balancing act scales again. So uh, the patient's name was Fred and Fred is sick of taking drugs and he wants you to stop some of them. So it's pretty plain to see that Fred's life expectancy is short. Uh, his EGFR is now 30 and obviously with progressive prostate cancer, uh, the risk is that that GFR will continue to decline. And so dibigatran is really not a good idea in this patient because it's renally cleared. It will increase his risk of bleeding. So you're thinking to yourself, oh God, what am I gonna talk to Fred about? He's got atrial fibrillation. He must have anticoagulation. He's also got cancer. So he might have an embolic strike at any minute. Uh, the other complicating thing for him is that in, uh, with that degree of renal impairment, his platelets also won't, won't be working very well. So aspirin, probably not a great choice of for Fred. So the other thing that Fred does have is LV systolic dysfunction. So he needs that metoprolol, the furosemide, and the salazoprol, and any alterations to those are probably completely off limits. I wouldn't even attempt it. So when I was a registrar, I, my consultant, uh, geriatrician, told me that uh, patients who had atrial fibrillation uh, had to fall about, well, he said 400 times, but it turned out that the study said 300 times, uh, in order to make anticoagulation more risky than not anticoagulation. And it, it took um, probably 15 years before I actually sought out this paper and read it. And actually, it's a modelling study, and there were no patients. So no one has actually done this trial. So yeah, while modelling studies are great, um, they don't tell the full story in real life. Um, but what and again, it's like stopping statins. Finding these studies and teasing them out is really not that easy. So, but I did find a few. So uh, I found this study here, which looked at um, a bunch of well, elderly, older veterans and um, who got a new diagnosis of dementia. So most of the time, this was in the United States, their warfarin was stopped, but for some of them, the warfarin was continued and they were followed up for four years. So the key thing in this little table, I think, is down here in the death. So after four years, there was no difference in death. There was no difference in stroke. Uh, and there was minor difference in bleeding. This didn't have any p-values as paper. I think the authors were disappointed with what they found. 
So what they found essentially was that it, whether the patient had warfarin or didn't have warfarin didn't make any difference to whether they had a stroke or not. Um, that didn't really make any difference whether they bled or not either uh, or died. So these were patients who were, had dementia basically, so a patient with a new diagnosis of dementia. So again, I'll cut to the chase in these little graphs which are impossible to see anyway. So these were 1,400 patients who were frail uh, and they uh, had, a, had a stroke and were discharged on or off warfarin. Uh, so it was almost half and half actually, and they were followed for a year. So the important thing is this slide down here, which I know you can't read, but and what it is is recurrent stroke. Um, and what it showed was no difference. So whether you got warfarin or not, uh, after a year, it didn't make any difference whether you had a stroke or not. Uh, the patients who didn't get warfarin died more frequently than the other patient that they may have been sicker to start with. Uh, and then there's this little trial here, which I'm only going to look at the warfarin bit because the aspirin is really low numbers. So the key things here are there's a group of 90 patients, 11 had four frequent falls and 17 had dementia, so small numbers. So 45% of the falls group died and 9% had a hemorrhage. 47% uh, of the demented group died. But of the overall, only 20% died. So the rates of death in these patients and hemorrhage was much, much higher uh, than the rate uh, in the all comers who didn't have falls or dementia. So no strokes in, in these groups, um, but two strokes in the overall one, in the fitter group. Um, so what I would say is that anticoagulation is kind of a difficult decision to make and you, you, you feel like you're being, um, you're really swimming against the tide um, if you don't prescribe anticoagulation for these patients and that is usually a decision that I try and make with the patient which is not always easy because their understanding of stats and percentages is not as good as ours. But what it comes down to, so for a patient like Fred he has a chance to VAS score of four. So when we say four, um, often this middle bit gets left out. So we say CHADS2 VAS score of four, must anticoagulate. But the actual bit in the middle is his actual risk of having a stroke, which is 8.5% per year. So it's quite high, depending on how you view these things. So we know warfarin risk reduces the risk by two thirds. That's what we tell our patients. So it takes the risk down to 5.6% per year. Um, and so working out the number needed to treat from those figures, you need to treat 34 patients like Fred for a year to prevent one stroke. So, you know, if, if, you, if Fred can, or Fred's family can get his head around that, um, it might help them to make the decision about anticoagulation. That perhaps the risks aren't as high as we thought of having a stroke and perhaps the risks of falls and hemorrhage, uh, sorry, of fatal hemorrhage in a patient who we know falls and has dementia, which appear to be the two highest risk factors, are quite high. Um, so leaving him on aspirin as well as dabigatran or uh, warfarin is obviously going to hugely increase risk for major bleeding, would not be recommended. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, if the patient has LV systolic dysfunction, um, then that is a that is a terminal condition. So uh, patients see the die of heart failure or they die with heart failure, and because unless you can get a transplant for them, you cannot cure it. And stopping these drugs can lead to a very unpleasant decompensation, and I have seen that when the drugs are left off the discharge somewhere, and the patient doesn't uh, inadvertently, and the patient doesn't take them, and then they come back to hospital and they're very sick. Um, and also I've seen people stop heart failure drugs not realising that the ACE inhibitor was for heart failure and not for hypertension or the beta blocker was for heart failure and not for hypertension or rate control or something else. So it really pays to get all your ducks in a row there, make sure that the drugs for heart failure are ring fenced and not changed. So Fred was on morphine. Um, his uh, obviously, when the EGFR gets below 30, morphine does become a little bit more difficult to use. Uh, okay at low doses, but for Fred, I think um, he was complaining and feeling sedated. So a change to a fentanyl patch, which is fully metabolized and not renally cleared, uh, is a good idea. And obviously, if patients on a fentanyl patch, which they're taking continuously, they need Lexol. 
So third patient, oh, sorry, Helen, do you want to ask, see if there's any questions about the anticoagulation? No, I think we're good. Um, there was just an earlier yes. question about aspirin, but other, other than that, we're good to forge ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So th this is a short, a, a quick um, case here. So uh, just a 78 year old lady called Lily with anxiety and depression, uh, tried multiple uh, antidepressants, uh, which none of which agreed with her, a low body weight of 36 kilograms. So uh, she probably has quite marked sarcopenia, a recent fall with marked facial bruising, hypertension and she's in rest home level care so this lady is clearly frail there is no doubt about that and the only medication that she's taking is triazolam um, which she's probably been on since the 1970s because it fell out of fashion not long after that so again the balancing act for Lily she's only on one medication um, so the benefit from ta her taking that medication well it helps her sleep and probably helps with her anxiety a bit the harms falls you know, over sedation the following day, the harms from withdrawing her drugs, this is probably the main one. So even though we know uh, benzos cause harm, we also know that stopping benzos can cause harm. We also know there would be probably benefits from stopping the benzo as well. So the question for patients like Lily, who we see just losing weight, and you know the weight is now in the in the 30 kilo mark. When she was prescribed that triazolam, she was probably 60 kilos. What happens when you lose the uh, lean tissue is um, everything bad happens, really. So um, the patient no longer has the muscle pump, so they stand up and can fall over. Uh, they do poorly in in everything, and obviously weight loss is part of frailty, and so it causes increased morbidity, morbidity and mortality. So what can we do for someone like Lily? Well, the only thing that has any proven benefit for her other than uh, nutritional deficits from vitamins and things like that, if they're present, uh, is giving protein. So uh, the protein need for elderly people is uh, 0.8 grams per kilogram a day. And so Lily was 36 kilos, and so she requires about 28 grams of protein a day, which can be... Um, delivered in three bottles of Fortisip, or the equivalent of Ensure to, de to deliver that amount of protein. Uh, and, and that has actually proven to have uh, benefits in muscle, uh, muscle mass. So it is worth doing for some of these patients if they will drink it. So what about the benzo? So benzos obviously have an, a, a number of risks. Um, the risk is of mortality is doubled in patients taking benzos. Um, so the short-acting ones like triazolam are worse for falls and fractures, <coughs> um, but changing it to a long-acting benzo means that it's going to be there the following day and interfere with uh, Lily's daytime ability to cope. So tapering, tapering the benzo does decrease the risk of falls. There is good evidence that actually doing something um, will improve the situation. Um, but they, they're very small trials, and I suspect that's because, well, these days we don't have that many patients on benzos, and also a lot of patients will just not agree. Uh, and I have seen patients uh, have grand mal seizures who were not epileptic because their benzos were stopped in hospital um, because some uh, clever person thought that they shouldn't be on a benzo and stopped the benzo. Patient had seizure and unfortunately uh, didn't do very well. <clears throat> so it is worth withdrawing the benzo. Uh, very, very slowly, but there is something to be gained from that. Uh, and for someone like Lily, adding in some 40 sip might help with her um, improving her muscle power. So in conclusion, um, I think treating middle aged and fit elderly. So in elderly people, I had a, a gentleman last week who I looked after who was 92. Uh, he came in with some, you know, an acute illness which got better. He went back home, he went back to playing his, um, uh, look, not lacrosse, croquet, uh, and driving his car and doing his shopping, and he was he was not frail, and so he was treated differently from a frail person. It's not an age thing, although aging increases the risk. But what's appropriate in middle age is usually not helpful in the frail elderly, and more likely to cause harm in the frail elderly uh, than any good. Frailty is a really key concept, I think. Uh, and I think once you've taken that step to diagnosing frailty, which 
using that frailty scale is actually pretty easy. You're on your way there. Uh, a lot of drugs that we prescribe at, thinking that they are long term actually only really benefit the patient in the short term and they could have a stop date put on them. Um, the benefits for many drugs are oversold and the risks are, are undersold. And the risks that may not be there in middle age are usually there in the frail. It's a giant balancing act. I'm going to work more on this diagram. Uh, and But I think that is the end of my presentation. That's fantastic, Chris. We've, we've had a few questions come in. Just before we go through them, um, just so everyone's aware, the, the video of the webinar with all of Chris's talking and all the slides um, if, will be on the website tomorrow and we'll email out a link to you all. So anyone who's missed the acronyms that um, Chris has used, she does explain them in her talk, so uh, um, you'll be able to go back and, and follow through the slides and see what um, OH was, orthostatic hypertension and things like that. So um, have no fear that it will be there. Um, so we've got a few questions coming through, Chris, if you're, you're ready to yep. forge ahead with them. Mm -hmm. uh, one yep. of them was, at the end of life when no oral tablets are being taken, I have um, stopped drugs for ca congestive heart failure. What yep. is that what you recommend? Yes, because if the patient isn't intaking anything, uh, including fluid, that usually sort of sets things to right, mm -hmm. which is kind of lucky, really. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we do the same. If the patient's not having any oral intake, Occasionally we have um, you know, junior staff or family asking about fluids, uh, no fluids, because if the patient has heart failure, you'll just tip them straight into heart failure. So yeah, that's, I might add a slide to say that, but yep, definitely, end of life, no medication needed if the patient's not having fluid. Okay, fantastic. Um, another one is I, I saw a patient recently on triazolam who had been on it for years and they introduced diazepam for weaning. I haven't seen this approach before in the elderly. The patient became delirious and we're wondering what your thoughts might be on that. Um, yeah, no, I, I know that you do change to, that is accepted practice in, for younger patients to change into a longer acting benzo and try and withdraw that. But I'm not aware of that approach in the elderly. Mm -hmm. um, I think you'd just be do, trading one harm off a different harm. Mm -hmm. So I know I wouldn't do that. I'd just try and withdraw the triazolam, I think. Mm. And there's been other questions along the line of the, the high risk of delirium and, and possibly mm. reduced quality of life, reducing um, benzos and zopiclone and sedatives in, in the elderly and, and I guess, you know, the balance of that approach. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah, no, I, t I totally agree. Um, obviously, patients, um, if they don't fall, then they're not even interested in falls, but what they are interested in is the fact they can't sleep. Yes. Uh, until they fall. Yes, yes. Uh, would you, or do you have any comments on anticholinergics potentially causing dementia? Yes. Absolutely, yep. So I always look at it, if the patient comes in and it seems to be like a new dementia, there's, I use four reversible causes, uh, anticholinergics, HIV, hypothyroidism and uh, vitamin B12 deficiency, and you know, HIV not very common. Uh, anticholinergics are super, super common uh, and I've seen multiple times patients coming in with uh, what looks like a delirium or dementia, and it's not, it's anticholinergics. So the anticholinergic burden is directly related to the cognitive decline. So the less anticholinergic burden the patient can be on, um, and you know, it's not always just the obvious anticholinergic drugs, there's things like digoxin and prednisone are anticholinergic, who knew? Uh, antipsychotics, um, most of them are anticholinergic as well. So if you can minimise the anticholinergic um, burden, the patient will do better, no doubt about that. Um, would you stop omeprazole in Joan in case one? Yes, I definitely would. I don't, I don't know why I didn't have a slide on that. Uh, what often happens, patient will come into hospital and you know they're unwell, and so someone starts an um, omeprazole, or uh, they have a you know short-term gastric upset, um, and and then the, the need for it is long, long gone. But the number of patients we're now seeing in hospital with low magnesium, and then they subsequent to that get a low calcium, and they're quite symptomatic with that. Uh, you know, there are quite a few of them. Um, and I think we're only knowing, we're starting to scratch the surface to know that cha profoundly changing the pH of the stomach, which you know, nature did intend to be an acidic thing uh, for good reason, is really does have effects on, on patients. Yeah. You know, with uh, you know, bugs, C. diff, aspiration, pneumonia, fractures, anemia. Like quite often, we'll see patients with anemia, no obvious cause. It's the omeprazole. Oh. So yeah, I 
I, for some patients, I start omeprazole, and that's for pretty much anyone on non steroidal, I give omeprazole, uh, which I know is not everyone's practice, low dose, um, but I stop it, or I try to stop it. It's actually hard to stop in a lot of people as well because of the potential for harm. Mm -hmm. Chris, there's been a series of questions that have come in around antipsychotics, um, mm -hmm. a special reference to clonazepine on, on lazepine, risperidone, and the metabolic. One is developing the metabolic consequences, so diabetes, thyroid, mm -hmm. and hematological impacts. Uh, mm -hmm. One is about the use of low dose risperidone uh, for sedation in the elderly. Mm -hmm. And one is uh, the use of antipsychotics um, in dementia. So I guess just generally there's a lot of uh, interest out here and, and a number of questions yeah. around antipsychotic use in this um, group. Yeah, it's a really difficult area. Um, you know, the antipsychotics are really only licensed for use in psychosis mm -hmm. and also um, for the symptoms of dementia. You know, the sort of the positive symptoms of dementia, difficult to manage dementia. But I know that they're used much, much more widely than that. Um, I don't think it's ideal using them for sedation in the elderly because they're quite dirty drugs. So um, things like quetiapine, olanzapine, you know, they don't have the adverse effects that the old antipsychotic do did, but they have a whole bunch of different ones. And those metabolic side effects, I saw a guy today who gained 30 kilos from his risperidone. Uh, and he was actually using it as an antipsychotic. Um, and that's not uncommon. Um, yeah, I, I find that to be a difficult area because I know a lot of elderly people do have trouble with sleep. I know the options aren't great. Um, I guess melatonin would maybe be an option. I know some people don't find it very effective and some you have to pay for it. Uh, it's, I, just, I think it's not ideal. Mm -hmm. I think it's a tricky, it seems like a very tricky um, and maybe individualised uh, decision for your patients here. Uh, yeah. yeah, definitely. <clears throat> uh, just we have time for a, a couple more. There's lots of questions coming in, but we, I know where we're running out of time. One is, um, I am a hospice pharmacist. I only heard the term frailty this year, and I've seen the frailty definition include a life expectancy of about a thousand days. What are your thoughts on predicting life expectancy once the frailty has been diagnosed? And I think you, you touched on that earlier, didn't you? I did. And about a thousand days, it strikes me as being kind of in the right ballpark. Mm. Um, you know, the studies I looked at, so anywhere between one year and five years. Five years seemed a bit long to me. Mm. Um, one year seemed a little bit nihilistic. So I would have said a thousand days. I haven't heard that saying before, but I think that's probably in the ballpark, yeah. Okay. And we have time for one more question here, and, and that is um, one here which talks about, do you have any suggestions or what your personal gold standard is for assessing the patient perspective on their medication? I think this is a lovely question to end on because you, your whole talk has really been based on, on being in, you know, having a discussion with the patient and relate, making these decisions as an individual. Yeah, it's, it's some patients are really receptive to the idea that, um, that maybe it's a good time to start looking at these medications and some of them might not be benefiting you anymore. Um, I usually start with that. Um, or actually, that's not strictly speaking true. If the patient has come with a harm, that is a kind of easy, easier conversation. So you've fallen. We know that these drugs are going to increase your risk of falling. I think we should try and look at them and trim them. So that's a really good approach. If there's no obvious harm, but there's obviously potential for harm, uh, then it's a conversation around, would you be, you know, are you interested in maybe withdrawing some of your medication? Because what was good for you at 60, sometimes it's more palatable to talk about age than frailty. Mm -hmm. Patients don't like to be told they're frail, and I cannot say I blame them. I think it'd be a horrible thing to say to somebody, <laughs> really. It just doesn't sound very nice. So sometimes I do relate it to age, even though in my brain it's a little white lie, and I'm actually thinking that the patient is frail. But if you tell people that what was good for them at 60 and maybe not good for them at 85, they kind of get that, mm. um, that they're a different person at 85 than they were at 60. Um, and so that, that can lead you into that discussion as well. Um, you know, I, I, most patients are actually quite receptive to that discussion, mm. but it, it does, sometimes does take a little bit of time um, to explain to them, you know, why you think it might be a good idea to either reduce the dose. I don't always de-prescribe completely, 
quite often if you lower the dose you still get some benefit but you, you almost wipe out the adverse effects so it doesn't always have to be an all or nothing either just sometimes just dropping the dose a bit will fix the problem um, but yeah it takes time and we don't always have a lot of time yeah. uh, unfortunately it's you know sometimes maybe scheduling appointment to discuss the medications um, it would be a useful thing to do rather than trying to tack it on at the end of a patient who's presenting with an issue. Hmm. Hmm. Look, great tips there, Chris, and thank you so much. And um, thank you everyone who's attended tonight and there's been a huge amount of questions. So hopefully we've got through most of them. Um, and I know that Chris, um, you've offered lots of really practical information that people can use. So thank you for all your expertise in this area and sharing it with us. Oh, thanks Helen, it was a pleasure. And I hope everyone and can go forth and deep describe. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. Good night, everyone.